purified by roses woods. <laughs> on the north and east, west, east side by Crossroads Wood. And on the west side by Stony Hill and Wood. The only area where you have any open space where there's not wooded leading out of here is toward the Rose Farm Sounds cool. and the Amateur Grove. <laughs> so, Detrobians per day is going to be here. And they're covering a large gap in the, Confeder in the Union line, extending from House Ridge, which we just left, uh, extending from there into the uh, uh, Stony Hill, and then on to the Peach Orchard. They have three, they have four small regiments. And they're going to uh, be attacked. The key thing to the Confederates is what we just dealt with. And that is seizing the triangular field, capturing three of Smith's guns, and they can turn north. And we're going to bring uh, Tig Anderson up here. And Tig Anderson is going to have the task of getting the Union troops out from this position here uh, before Union reinforcements can arrive. We've already talked to one Union reinforcement brigade. That's going to be the brigade commanded by Edward Cross. The next one that's going to show up is Zook's brigade, five Pennsylvania regiments. And they're going to come out of the Trostle Woods. At the end of Trostle Woods is the Millertown Road. And when we get closer to it, we can see where Zook is going to die. You don't want to be a brigade commander in Caldwell's division. <laughs> We've already told you what is going to happen uh, to, to Cross. The same thing is going to happen to Zook. Now first, before I turn it over to uh, 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 Jeff, we've got to deal with a loser. <laughs> the loser is James Barr. The only thing good I can say about him is a classmate of Robert E. Lee's back in 1829. And his men are going to, he's going to send Children and Schweitzer's brigades up on to uh, uh, up on to uh, Stony Hill, but they ain't going to hold that position. They're going to fall back into Crossville Woods. They're going to be hugging the ground in Crossville Woods when Zook comes forward. Zook is pissed off when he sees them hugging the ground and wondering why they're not advancing. He's going to pass over them, and then probably Zook passing over them are going to be Kelly's brigade. Finally coming in here is, uh, is going to be uh, Brooke's brigade, and Brooke is going to reach the Rose House. See that see that uh, uh, picket fence there? That's the Rose House. That's going to be the high water bar. Now we want to find out what the Confederates are doing. And no one better to go to the, to, to the Confederates is uh, uh, Jeffrey is going, Jeff is going to be General McClaws because we're now committing McClaws' troops. We're going to be committed now. And we'll bring up General McClaws or uh, General Longstreet. I don't know which he's going to be right now. I'm going to be General Anderson first. Uh, no, and only to show, you know, Anderson's men, they're going to be, you see the, on your map number 13, you'll see the fight of the... Anderson's men are going to come through these woods here, Rose's woods. They're going to be the initial ones to engage the 17th Maine. By the way, 17th Maine deserves far more credit than to get here because everybody remembers the 20th Maine. 
they are going to hold this wall to the last extremity. They are going to receive an order to retreat. They're going to refuse to retreat. Uh, the brigade commander's up there. Then Bernie's up there. And the order, finally, on the third order to retreat, they will retreat. They'll go the whole way across the wheat field. They'll get up there by the Millerstown Road and the Trotsell's Woods. They're going to have a little bit of time to rest before the next wave comes in. The poor devils are asked to go out here to the crest of that hill and hold on as long as they can. And they obey that order. So this fight that they make along this stone wall. In fact, you know, they say the wheat field changed hands six times. Basically what changed hands right at is this wall six times. Yes. Because it went back and forth here. But the laws is out there. As I told you this morning, he really doesn't going to have control of his division too much because old Pete Longstreet's staying with him. And the first brigade that he's going to send in is Joseph Kershaw, South Carolinians. Now the problem with them, because they haven't crushed the salient yet, because they have not unleashed Barksdale uh, yet to attack that, or Wolford behind them, and both Sims and Kershaw are going to run into that, they're going to come across the road field. But there's a line of Union Cannon along the Wheatfield Road, north of the road, and they are going to pound Kershaw's regiment. He has to swing three regiments there to attack and deal with that artillery. So initially, he's not at full strength as he's going to come down through the Rose Farm. And if you see the very famous photograph of the dead line afterwards, and they believe that they are his South Carolinians, correct, Ed? Yes. So, and it's over here. You go by back there in the road. They have the photograph and the marker to show you where that actual Fasten, Bill Fastenito was the one who, of course, located that and changed the description. That made that made photographic part of the Civil War with modern ones a, a, a viable research. Absolutely. And so he comes swinging through here, and their their accounts are pretty clear about they're going to attack Stony Hill, but they are, as I said, this is under strength. Behind them will come Paul Sims, Georgia. Paul Sims is going to lead the attack a certain distance, but then Paul Sims is going to be mortally wounded. Sims is one of those guys that he always tried to dress well. It's, you know, it was like he was going to a wedding and ended up at a funeral. And, no, in that sense of me, way it's like Hancock. Hancock always wore a white shirt. You thought he was, you know, dressed well. So did Paul Sims, and Paul Sims was a highly capable. Off, uh, brigade commander, but I think they, they have now marked a spot where they think they were. Yeah. Paul Sims has fallen out here in those fields. He is going to be mortally wounded. So his Georgians are going to uh, get time, but initially it's Kershaw, and they're going to fight for the Stony Hill. They're going to be battling the Second Corps regiments as Zook's men come through. And that, by the way, Samuel Zook was a Quaker from Philadelphia. He went against his faith and his family's wishes to go in the army. And, he, and he's going to die here at Gettysburg, one of the Pennsylvanians who do so. But they're going to push down through where you see the Rose Farm and over through there. You see well on the map, the South Carolina regiments are Kershaw's, the Georgians coming behind them. But Anderson's men are also going to push through here. Then they're going to be driven back. And here's where the ebb and flow will go over the stone wall area. And of course, and the Stony Hill is called the Stony Hill from the accounts of the the soldiers called it afterward. Now we all use that phrase, the Stony Hill. <laughs> it's not named by the... No. And somebody asked me, and that can correct me, they asked about Devil's Den. Devil's Den is antebellum. It was supposed to be a huge snake that used. Uh, was in the Devil's Den area, and they called it the Devil, so they just called it Devil's Den. Is that right, Ed? Yes. That's what I like. It's a place. What? It's a local tri-stick place. Oh, it was all, oh, uh, of course, Ed would always bring that part of it in. <laughs> <laughs> it was a local place where couples met, okay? <laughs> Whatever. They also had picnics there. I don't know what that is. Anyway, uh, yeah, so if you want to know why it is, that's why it's called Dell. And that was, local people called it that, okay? Any questions? Yeah, or Jeff, is Barnes court-martialed or just relieved? Wasn't he charged with being drunk here as well as being a coward? He's not, he's not going to go to court-martial, but he's going to uh, get serious criticism and never again command <laughs> combat troops. Uh, Riley, though, is accused of being drunk. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. He, he's out. Only because he was. 
Well, I would say, I would say <laughs> And also, they're, they're going to also send in succession in this field Kelly, who is going to come the same general route that Brooke does, and then the one who goes the furthest is Brooke, and he gets up to the. Uh, so what time? What time down. does the fifth core unit get? Fifth core unit get here. Any other questions? Oh, uh, you know, the, when the Schweitzer, Schweitzer and Tilton will enter it before Schweitzer the second will be corps. coming in here to have to cover the retreat, but he go out of here. Right. <laughs> and Schweitzer has the 4th Michigan with him. And that's Colonel Jeffords there holding the flag. And Jeffords is going to get uh, bayoneted to death there. And he's buried up near Ann Arbor, Michigan. Well, you see where Schweitzer and Tilton are in here before. Uh, the second corps comes in, but that's it. They're going to cover the retreat of these other regiments, sir. That, that's later, yeah. Yeah. So this man's going to hold his map up, and it has it oriented correctly. <laughs> hold it like this. Everybody <laughs> hold your map like this, and you have it oriented correctly. Now, Sickles is feeling fairly good. He has held his saying here, using the massed artillery. I'm going to have to start talking. I cannot wait for the uh, for the for the daydreamers to bullshit. <laughs> so we're going to I'm sorry, talking now. Now we look at all the Union cannons are pointing south. These Union cannons are pointing westward. You've got a right angle here. And it's Sickles so far has got away with this false position. He's holding this angle here with Graham's brigade. Graham is a political crony and, a, and a, an important player in the Philadelphia Navy Yard, government job. <coughs> so the Union line is going to extend along the Emmitsburg Road position beyond the, uh, the Klingle house. In fact, you can see that white fence. That's the Rogers fence. Comes down that line here and then turns a right angle and goes that way in that direction. Now we have, we're on the defense. It's done well. It's been pretty hard on the second car and the, and the, uh, Fourth uh, and Second Corps and Fifth Corps to enable us to do it. But right now he's holding his position, and we have on our we have with us none other than General Longstreet, and he's about ready to uh, give uh, General McClaws his orders to advance. So he's already sent in Kershaw and Sims, as I said. William, he's with William Barksdale. They're out here on the north side of the Wheatfield Road. And, uh, north and south, the one regiment south of the road, as you see in your map, 21st. Barksdale, as you know, former congressman. He is this firebrand secessionist. He's chomping at the bit. He keeps asking uh, the Longstreet, when can I go in, when can I go in? And then finally, Longstreet says, now. And as again, I told you, Longstreet wanted to pound, pound, pound. They're going to come out of here, and the counts are they basically hit like a hurricane or a whirlwind. And they are going to simply crush this salient right up through here. 21st uh, over here, 13th, uh, what, 17th and 18th over here. And they're just going to really shatter the salient here. And that's the problem with the salient, you get hit three sides. A couple regiments of Kershaw is coming this way to put pressure on them, but they're going to drive them back. Uh, the very famous Troiani print of it, you know, showing this in the 114th Pennsylvania fighting them. By the way, further up you'll see in the maps 105th Pennsylvania. They too are going to be driven back. By accounts, we're not sure how many times in the face of these Mississippians because Barksdale is going to wheel and head towards the Trotsil Farm across these fields. 105th Pennsylvania either regroup eight or ten times. And they're falling back and firing a volley. And every time they regroup and fire a volley, they shout at Pennsylvania, Pennsylvania. You know, we're not gonna, we're, this is our land and we're not giving 
it up easily. And they will, but of course, this is the Mississippi. It's behind them. And what is interesting comes to uh, William Warford's brigade. They're just going to come right down here. And anything that's basically <coughs> left in the Yankees along the wheat field road, they're going to sweep, sweep away. And they're going to drive towards the wheat field. In fact, they're going to reach the wheat field. What is very interesting is the comment of uh, writings that Longstreet made after this. It's a rather curious one. He will actually order Wolford to pull back. He's going to go to basically about Hawk Ridge. He's going to meet, run into the Pennsylvania Reserves and that. But Longstreet will write that the attack went further than I wanted it to. Well, how far did you want him to go? And what do you mean by that? Wasn't the object to taint this position? But that's what he writes. And Wolford uh, thought that the order was a mistake. And he is, of course, going to uh, question it, but he, and he will retire. Barksdale, meanwhile, they're going to sweep across these fields, going towards the Tronsil Farm, Bigelow's Knife Massachusetts Battery out here. And in these fields out here somewhere, Barksdale is going to be mortally wounded. He will be attended by, and I read it in the regimental history, by surgeons of the 148th Pennsylvania at the Hummerball Farm is where he is going to die. The, the main thing they said about him was he was, you know, heavy man, not overweight and that. They talked about him, thought he was a little soft and stuff, but of course he's a general. But he was he, he would be picked up that night and taken back there. But this is one of the great attacks. There's a new book on it. All I understood from the reading about it, I forget who did it, Phil, somebody. Uh, they said the, the, the writing's rather overwrought. You know, a little bit too hyped up here and stuff like that. But I just wanted, if you want to, it's the most recent account of it. Uh, I don't know, it could be very good. What? It could be Philip Tucker. But uh, it isn't, you know, please, whatever you, maybe you'll find a lot in there. But they think it gives them too much credit. But they just, they just crush this. <laughs> Barksdale, Mississippi, they just simply crush this silly. But, uh, particularly Barksdale is going to go with the 21st Mississippi. Right. And he's going to pass on either side of the Trostle House. He's going to capture five guns of Bigelow's battery. He's going to capture the four guns of Watson's battery. Just with the 21st Mississippi. The 18th, 17th, and 13th Mississippi are going to move up there and they're going to roll uh, uh, uppers up like a carpet. And then advancing out of the woods on Barksdale's left will be uh, will Wilcox. be Wilcox's men. Fortunately, Wilcox will advance and as will Lang on his left. And then uh, they will press forward, but it's going to have uh, some big, uh, they're going to have some big trouble when it comes to posing. Because Posey is not going to advance, except for one regiment. And you're going to have them sweeping all before them. And you're going to have a whole company of men target the bar scale. Then the, 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 then the uh, three other Mississippi regiments are going to be stopped by a charge of the Harper's Ferry <laughs> Power. Uh, headed by Colonel Willard, and they're going to be checked as they're getting to unravel them. One other thing I should add, and they write about it, especially with Alexander, what he does, and what's an unusual thing in the battlefield, as soon as they crush this, he rolls, he, he brings the cannons forward. They say it's a rather magnificent scene, as you can imagine. The cannons hit stuff, the horses, and they're rolling forward to occupy this ground, but he will follow in the immediate wake of the infantry attack and they're going to come and establish this position. But other accounts that say that, they, they seldom see that on the battlefield, that opportunity. But Alexander is going to be very quick to act to do that, and they're going to come here. And this is going to be the platform. And accounts that Lee says on July the 3rd, this is the platform he talks about that they can use to bombard the Union lines, the initial platform and the ridge that goes out through there. 
so they will follow it up and they will start the fire on the cemetery ridge from here. And what they're going to do, they will may be, the first guns up here may be the gun that's going to fire the shot and it's going to get rid of Donna Tui's boyfriend. That settles up there. <laughs> I just saw Donna there and I could see uh, a light of ecstasy in her eyes. <laughs> and I mentioned, uh, Dan Sickle. And they could be one of them. Now, Peter Wentz used to visit his grandparents here. And his house would be right there. So he's with Longstreet. Oh, now he's down his artillery. So he knows this well of visiting his grandparents. So right now, it's looking pretty good for the Confederates. It looks like uh, they may be on the way uh, to uh, winning a big thing. Any questions? How did either side deal with the fences between where they started the attack and moved forward? What's that? The fences. the fences. How did they deal with the fences? The defenses are as long as they are worm fences. A 90 pound weekly can throw that fence down. A 90 pound weekly can grab that log, those one of those cross beams where they cross and lift up, excuse me, and the whole thing of fence goes down. Now, if it's a post and rail fence like that, you've got to climb over it. But the, uh, but the, uh, the worm fence is easy to throw down. And those post and rail fences were well built. They were Much they were better well than built. the park service. Why didn't they have engineers out there with axes to chop them down? They did. And that, and that, that yeah, really, what the hell? Yeah, well, I know, but and I'll tell you what we talk about tomorrow. It's one of the inexplicable things. And the fences, the fences become a, a shooting gallery for the pickets yeah. men and the credit crews men. They don't, uh, you know, they, they they have to clamber over them, and uh, they're going to get caught. They, nobody moves ahead to knock them down. Just, there's no even account of the consideration of the fences, and that's an important thing. If you look at that monument there, that will become very, very popular after 9-11. The 73rd New York Volunteers had all been fired. And there you've got a soldier on one side, and you've got a volunteer fireman on the other side, uh, hosing down the fire. So after 9-11, all the uh, publications that have any historical sense of all will be publishing that monument. Any other questions? All right, we're going to go by Sickles. I'm going
Come on, Augustine, quit playing with your goddamn pumpkin. <laughs> 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 All right. Oh, we'll we'll be able to get away with that. Thompson gets your shot. <laughs> okay, Campus. Oh, me. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Campus wise, we're at nine. We're talking. Very good brigade commander. One of the best. Four Alabama regiments. You can see them there in the map. What's that? 10th, oh, uh, number 11. 10th, 11th, 14th, and 9th. And they're going to come through the field, swinging out here. They're going to cross. They're going to clean up, if you will. There's the Clinton Farm. There's the Sherpy Farm. They're going to come across there. They're going to clean up what is of Humphrey's division as they are being, uh, as Ed said, rolled up like a carpet by the three Mississippi regiments. They're going to come down here and plunge into uh, the Plum Run Valley. Things are going real well. There's not much in front of them that they can see, and they're driving towards us. To the left is Lang's division of Floridian. They're rather under strength. Uh, that was uh, Perry's uh, br uh, not division, Brigade of uh, Florida. They're under strength under Lang. They probably only number few, that, over a thousand or so. Uh, but Curry was a commander, but he's out. Lang's coming to their left. And all that's left here is the 1st Minnesota. So this is, in some sense, I know Wright gets the credit, in a sense, of going farther. This right, which will be up here. But with these two brigades coming through here, the Mississippians coming to support the 21st down there, and there's not much here. They're driving towards this position right here where we stand. And these Alabamians are very, very good troops, and uh, they're they're uh, they're coming here. So, uh, Ed, you know you're the Yankees, right? All right, I I'm. You're right now. You can see the Union are gone, about ready to go down for the count of ten. They're probably staggering at the count of nine. All the Union have are, are several hundred men that are still surviving of Humphrey's division that have any integrity to them. We have two batteries of artillery, glory and another, and the only infantry that we have is the first of the uh, the round. Uh, we're back in here and hands out these infantry now. So he'll go to Colonel Colville. And he's going to tell Colonel Colville, I want you to charge those people. There are at least a thousand Alabamians who can advance a long way giving the Yankees lots of pain and suffering. If they can reach this point here, they might just win the battle. And Hancock goes there, and Kozel is unimpressed. <laughs> Hancock is a person you don't make. He is not an A.P. Hill. He's not a Dick Anderson. And he's loud and a and an overbearing. And he is going to ride up and come Colville is said, You want me to charge those people? And he says, Yes, you will charge those people. And probably uses a lot of profanity along with it. So Colville is going to he and his lieutenant and his major are going to mount their horses. They're going to have their men fix their bayonets, count and prime their pieces, and they are going to charge this force that outnumbers them four to one. I don't think the Alabamans can really believe what is going to happen. So they're going to charge forward. They're going forward at a trot. They've got that one fence to cross. 
They're going to hold that one fence across the fence and go on, and they're going to wait till they're within about 40 yards of the Alabamians. It's now beginning to sink into the Alabamians. You had better uh, take some action. These guys mean their business. We may be outnumbering them four to one. But we had better do, but before they can get bring order out of uh, conversation pieces, they halt and fire one volley into them and charge them with the bayonet. So for a momentarily, the initiative is passed from the Confederates to the Union, to the Union, as they're, they're not going to stay there very long. They're going to lose 80% of their men, but they have stopped the Alabama. Uh, and then Wilcox will send a message to Anderson. Do you know what Anderson replies? No. He says, you can imagine what Wilcox is going to say. Persevere. Things all get better. <laughs> You can imagine what Wilcox is going to say. It's going to be all those horrible words about ancestry, courage, and everything else uh, describing uh, Anderson. So they're beginning, uh, if you're going to have it, suppose, uh, you have having the thing that Anderson has sprung to pass. And the initiative is going to pass uh, to the enemy. Hancock is going to grab different people you're going to find and throw them in and Robert E. Lee is not going to interfere Anderson uh, A.P. Hill is not going to interfere and their chances of winning are going to disappear Ed said earlier, early Posey's next in line and Posey is going to only go forward and he's going to hold most of the brigade and one regiment will continue on for a while Next in line was Wright, and Wright's going to do the charge, but to support him was supposed to be Billy Mahone's brigade. Um, I know a fellow has been working years and years at Billy Mahone, and he can't figure out what he did here, and the answer is, as he concluded, nothing. Of any Confederate general here, he, got, he did absolutely nothing that we know of, given the fact that his casualties are so low, they're almost uncountable compared to everybody else. He does nothing on July 2nd, and he will do nothing on July 3rd. But by you know, as well as I do, in 64, Billy Mahone is emerging as one of the finest division commanders in the Army in Northern Virginia. But again, you're looking at Anderson Control or A.P. Hill. There simply is. The key factor we talked about briefly, of course, is William Dorsey Pender, and he's moving forward on the other side of what would be the Dory Barn, and that on the other side of Wright. Wright's going to go on the other side going towards Cemetery Hill. That would be Pender. Rhodes was under orders. If you find an opportunity to advance, you should advance. He will find none in the second, nor in the third. So his Gettysburg experience does not get any better. And it's another critical fact. Early will be furious because he believes that his two brigades are sacrificed in their attack to the East Cemetery Hill that evening because Rhodes never moves. Rhodes is supposed to come to his support and attack the west side of it, and he doesn't do it. So there's this breakdown. As I told you before, Porter Alexander says the machine has to be well oiled. It was not well oiled here. And with Lee only receiving one message and saying one, you can see whether his method of command works well when you have a Stonewall Jackson and a James Longstreet. It does not work well when you have new corps commanders, particularly Hill, who is not aggressive, and he just was, you know, raised up to where beyond what he could do. But it's hard to tell. And I keep repeating, what does AP Hill do here? And it's almost a mystery. This is a critical point, as Ed said. Any kind of uh, a Confederate push of any sort, of any strength, would have probably taken this position from the third court and it doesn't happen. All right, any questions before we go down and get our picture taken? I got 10 minutes, Grace, to get your picture taken before we go to our last stop. All right, I have, that's why the...
Build a car. And you're going to be, uh, you're here, I've been joined by General Wright. Uh, he is going to go further than any other of the Confederate forces. He's going to find out if he's going to count on any support on his left. He's landing on a weak read. I get to be General Hancock. I represent General Meade. Meade has picked me for this purpose because he knows that I'm going to scrounge people up from anywhere to use them uh, to contain uh, what is uh, looks like it might be the end of the Army of the Potomac. I think, uh, as again, uh, the Army of the Potomac, as uh, as, I, as, as, uh, as Jeff made last night, and I'll re-emphasize it tonight in my talk, who is a real hero of Round Top, uh, the Union Army, uh, composed more than a third of the group of Pennsylvania, have a special interest in this battle. Uh, I think Jeff got it, did it much better than I could have done. And the descriptions he gets out of the diaries of how crossing the Maryland line affects the Union group, particularly the Maryland. And uh, Hancock is going to capitalize on that here. Take away. Okay, very briefly, very quick. I was talking on the bus. Grand White Georgians are going to be coming here. There's the next brigade in line. And they're going to come storming across here. And they're going to drive. They're going to drive back towards Cannon. And they're going to come in this area, basically south of the tops, down through here, and reach to this area where we're basically standing. And they're driving away everything in front of them. The uh, cannons were out here. Uh, what battery was it in? Uh, it's a, a B. Uh, uh, first New Jersey Browns back. Browns, right. And they're going to override, and he's going to go here. And he's going to be in this position as we're standing. He will say later, as he looks to his left for support, when he will tell Alexander on July the 3rd, as Alexander questioned him, he said, the problem is not getting there. The problem is staying there. The Confederates are going to find out on July the 3rd that there is a problem getting there. <laughs> Once the Union artillery and everything is in play here, where since the line was so, well, there's not much of uh, what's going to be here on uh, July the 3rd is far different than what is left here on July the 2nd. But Wright's going to go farther than any other Confederate brigade on July the 2nd. Again, Wright is a very capable officer. His Georgians are veteran troops, and they are going to make this charge, and they're going to sweep everything, overrun the battery, and drive up to this point where we're roughly standing. And before they get here, they route the two, three Union regiments that are out there on Emmitsburg Road. The 80th New York, the 15th Massachusetts, and the 20th, uh, and the uh, and the 19th uh, May are routed. So there is a gap here. What does Hancock do? He is not going to worry about General Posey. He is going to the National Zouaves, the 11th New York, who is the headquarters guard near the Willow Leicester's house, and he's going to tell them to get their keisters up here. He's going to get their keisters up here. He's going to uh, the 13th uh, Vermont, commanded by Colonel Randall. These men will be out of the service in two weeks. They're a 90, they're a six, a nine month regiment. And a particularly the hero of theirs will be uh, Captain Lothridge, good Irish boy, and Sergeant and Lieutenant Stephen Brown. Brown was under arrest for some minor, uh, minor uh, error, and and you have to have your sword for your symbol of office. They can't find his sword when he releases him from arrest, and he will find a camp hatchet as a symbol <laughs> of leadership. It's been incorporated in the monument. They will bring up uh, the. Uh, they'll bring up the 106th Pennsylvania, and they will commit man. 
It will commit the uh, the uh, thirty uh, the thirteenth uh, road thirteenth uh, uh, Vermont, and they'll advance all the way to the Rogers house. See that white picket fence? In doing it, they'll recapture Julian Weir's battery, which had been captured. Remember, they also Confederates had captured Brown's battery in front of this. When the Confederates counter, when the Union counterattacked, they recover those batteries. Now, this is the difference between, uh, rather, Hancock is on the scene, uh, he has the authority, and he's scrounging up men from all over to make sure this gap will not be exploited by the Confederate soldiers. So, twice, uh, so you're going to find out the, between Hancock's actions in the first Minnesota, Hancock's actions of throwing in Woodard's brigade, Hancock's actions of throwing in the, uh, the, the 13th Ver, uh, Ver, uh, Vermont, throwing in the, the, uh, the headquarters guard, throwing in people of the Pennsylvania reserves. He is finding people, and when they don't move fast, he is going to uh, let them know that he is the boss. And they're going to be in serious trouble if they don't do otherwise. This is an uh, instance of using one man with command and control. And you can see the other side, as uh, uh, as Jeff has pointed out, is uh, the senior commands are fucking uh, uh, the uh, opportunity they have here. And, uh, and it is not General Longstreet's fault. It's some other people's fault. And you can uh, figure uh, pretty well by what we talked about today, whose fault it is. Just to add the confusion of how confusing the battlefield is, they ordered the 12th Corps off. And of course, you lead George Green's uh, brigade behind, which we'll talk about tomorrow, right, Ed? Yes. On the Cops Hill. But Gary's going to lead the rest of his uh, division off. And he turns in Baltimore Pike, and they're marching away from the battlefield. You know, they're, and they get down to Rock Creek and realize, you know, the fight's over here. So, I mean, even in all, you know, best intentions and all that, those things happen. There would have been obvious Williams troops coming here, even in further, if the Confederates had gone more, there would have been more reserves uh, coming up. Whether they would, I don't think they could have been able to stop a Dorsey Pender's division by any means, certainly led by Dorsey Pender, but there, there was still this element of reserves. They probably would have pulled off some of the First Corps, even, if we got that desperate. But then that's where Early would have been coming into it. Because we're getting to the, about the time, not quite when Early's going to make his attack, but nearly that time. And the guys that are going to turn Early back come from here. Yes. Yes. They're sent here by Hancock. He's going to send a Carroll's Brigade, which right. is going to be instrumental. And uh, the, the regiments that Ed was talking about, the Massachusetts, New York, and the Maine, they're all part of Gibbons' division. And what's left, and they were sent out there. So there's not much left except these, but those three regiments all belong to Gibbons' division, which held this section. Any questions? Hey, Ed, why isn't there a J in the batteries or designation? Oh, right, there's a J when you're writing script looks an awful lot like an I. So whether it is in the American Army of today, uh, the Marine Corps of today, or the soldiers of the uh, the Civil War, there is no J. Because you wrote in script at that time, and a J and an I was an awful lot alike. We used to wonder why there was no J. And I didn't learn until after it was out of the Marine Corps. Oh, really? Why there was no J. There were 680-some casualties in rights brigade. How 